to drop with this talk, so man that needs no introduction, round of applause for Dave Hall. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, more importantly, round of applause for our sponsors who made all this possible. All right, and with that, as is tradition, I've got way too many slides, so uh, we're gonna move pretty quick here, I think. So the title of the talk, it's um, maps, I mean gaps, all the way down. It's gonna be about why detection and incident response are hard, and maybe a look at some things we can do to make them easier. And maybe we can get some ideas from the audience during this as well. Can you guys see this okay? So what you're looking at is a, a process timeline. This is part of a detection uh, that where I work at Red Canary, we would ship this off to a customer. Uh, this is the start of it anyway, before we kind of go in and uh, make it make sense for people. The top line there, for folks in the back that may not be able to see it, it's uh, Windows Explorer process spawned, followed by uh, conhost, child process of Windows Explorer. Conhost, if you don't know, is the Windows console host process. And it typically fires when you run a command shell application or PowerShell application, some, anything that runs at the Windows console uh, or the, the command prompt, that kind of thing, uh, you'll see conhost spin up as a child process. In this case, we've got conhost spinning up as a child process of Explorer. And then conhost is running command shell. If you were uh, somebody that was getting data like this, uh, or looking over the timeline, is there anything here that you would find concerning? Anyone? Anyone? I have multiple EXEs. Multiple EXEs? All right, well, I'll break it down a little bit. So, again, the console host application runs when you run a command shell. So these are in chronological order from top to bottom here. So we've got Explorer. Is Explorer a console-based application or is it a GUI-based application? It's a GUI-based application. So to see Explorer spawning the Windows console host is really weird. The Windows console host almost always has command line arguments. And in this case, there are no command line arguments in this screen. And conhost never has child processes. And here it's spawning command shell. So this is, seems a little suspicious. If you were the detection engineer or the security incident response person and you were looking at this, what additional data would you want to try and what we call adjudicate uh, whether or not this was malicious or just weird? What level of access the user has? What level of access the user has? What else? What other data do you want if you're investigating this? What else do you want to see? What kind of commands they tried to run? What commands were run in the command prompt? I can tell you right now there are no child processes of this. What was that? Startup applications. Startup, like ASAPs, that kind of stuff. The startup locations, what runs at startup on this machine. Anything else? Uploads and downloads. Uploads and downloads. What about security event log? Anybody? Full disk image? No? Memory capture? I see one head shaking over here. Yes, for memory capture. So think about when you're doing uh, security incident response work and you get a set of data like this. Generally, people want additional data points to, to try and adjudicate whether or not something like this is malicious. So I just wanted to, first off, kind of set the stage here and get you thinking about detection engineering and the kinds of problems uh, that you're going to be faced with as a DE. And then we'll jump into this. This is kind of the overview of what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to do introductions, going to find out a little bit about who you all are, tell you who I am very briefly. And then we'll go into why uh, detection and security and incident response are hard problems. We've already started with one example, and there will be plenty more. So first off, let's do some introductions. Raise your hand if you do detection engineering work, security incident response work, digital forensics, blue team in general. All right, so there's a number of you out there. Uh, what about pen test, red team? Any of those folks in the room? So uh, for those of you that are doing security and certain response work, digital forensics, anything like that, do you find your, your job to be difficult? 
It's a lively audience. Yeah, so if you think your job is hard, you're not alone. So this is Dan Gear. he's an industry luminary. Uh, he's got a long backstory. He keynoted at Black Hat uh, a few years back, and I've included this slide in other presentations before because it makes me feel good about thinking my job is hard. Uh, so Dan Gear said in, in this Black Hat talk, security is quite possibly the most intellectually challenging profession on the planet for two reasons. Complexity and rate of change are your enemy. He doesn't even mention the fact that we're fighting against adversaries that are trying to make our jobs difficult. Uh, and I think that's a big part of it. So if you think your job is hard, it's not just you. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, so I do detection engineering at Red Canary, try and make it easier for us to catch bad things uh, more efficiently. And that's really enough. We've got plenty of stuff to cover here. So let's dive into uh, the meat of it. So there's going to be some things that are out of scope for this talk. For like, if you've got 50,000 endpoints in your environment or 10,000 endpoints in your environment, you have a hard problem of just centralizing all of the interesting security telemetry and doing analysis on it. I'm not going to cover that in this talk. It's beyond the scope of this. It's largely a solved problem in lots of environments. Uh, so that's out of scope. We're not going to talk about easy detections. We're going to talk about hard detections. Uh, and so let's get right into it with a quick tour of kind of the problem space. And we'll start out with uh, false positives and false negatives, or why am I so negative about false positives? And I'm not trying to pick on any EDR platforms here specifically, um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, there are gonna be several different platforms shown here, and I had to rip out a bunch of slides for other platforms because I just don't have time. Uh, what you're looking at here is kind of a chopped up screenshot from one of the EDR platforms that's out there in the world. And the top line, if you can't see it there, we've got a command shell running a batch file, and it has a child process of run DLL32. There's a redacted uh, LSAS PID on the command line here that I've blanked out uh, just to protect the innocent. And if you can't see all the details here, that's okay. Uh, we're gonna go through it. So LSAS, for people that don't know, it's the Local Security Authority Subsystem Service, and it handles uh, enforcing the local security policy and it handles authentication. And because of that, LSAS process memory really contains the keys to the kingdom. If you've ever run Mimikatz, it opens a handle to LSAS and scrapes memory and finds all the credentials. And uh, so LSAS is just a juicy target on the endpoint. But you have to have the, the right rights. You have to have the right permission level to be able to read LSAS process memory. No problem. We've got an account here, NT Authority System. It has the necessary rights. And so what we have is run DLL32 calling this function, that's the mini dump function in this DLL, com services DLL, that's a DLL that comes with Windows, it ships, it's on the box, it's signed, and it's saying dump the memory from this PID, which is redacted, and write the data out to this file. The EDR platform detected this, wonderful. And it's a high detection, it says down there at the bottom. High confidence, high criticality, I don't know. But this process actually failed. This didn't actually, this won't work. Uh, I don't recommend that you go try running this command in your environment because you'll probably trigger your EDR products. Um, but as an analyst, if you got this alert, and someone on my team got this alert and they spent a bunch of time trying to figure out where is this dump file? Uh, and it wasn't on disk because this command as it's written on screen, won't work, even if you have the PID in there for LSAS. There's something missing about that command. So you've got a false positive there, which is gonna cause an analyst to spend a bunch of time looking at it, uh, when in fact, it's a waste of time. This process, however, create dump from snapshot.exe, which is a child of command shell, wrote this file, uh, lsas.dump in the temp directory. Zero alerts from the EDR platform in this case. Uh, so you've got a case of a false positive that's going to be a time suck for the analyst and a false negative that the analyst isn't even going to know about. So that's one set of problems, false positives, false negatives. You, you've all seen them. Another platform out there, and there are a couple of different EDR platforms that work this way. Instead of centralizing all of the security telemetry that they're collecting into some giant data store, they keep it all in the endpoints, and you have to query the endpoints for that data. So this one, um, this little section I'm gonna call Catch Me Online, if you can. So this screenshot is from uh, the Red Canary portal. So when our analysts are 
looking at alerts, they see a screen like this. And in this particular case, we've got SVC host, which is uh, a managed, uh, or sorry, unmanaged code. So this is old legacy Windows application written in C, C++. It does all its own hardware uh, integration, its own memory management, all of that. Uh, so it's what typically is referred to as unmanaged code. This thing is, uh, just note the command line arguments here, not super important, but just to keep it straight that we're looking at the same SVC host process in a couple of screens. This thing, uh, SVC host, is loading system management automation, which is PowerShell's DLL, which is uh, managed code, you know, written in .NET. There's a, it runs in a virtual machine that handles all the hardware interaction. Uh, so it's really weird to see unmanaged process loading managed code like this. And typically, when you see something like this, it's because you've got an attacker who has used Metasploit or PowerShell Empire or one of the other tools out there, and they've injected into some process like SVC host, and when they do that injection, typically the client is gonna bring along the PowerShell DLL. Usually if you see something like this, you wanna go investigate it. So in this case, we jumped over to the EDR platform, and we started running some queries, and if you can't quite make that out in the back, it says, uh, search files and processes for file SVC host.exe on hostname redacted. It's able to catch this endpoint while it's online, but it comes back and says, I got more than 500 results. Uh, if you want to grab more than that, go use the API. I'm sure this EDR platform has a wonderful API. I don't have time to master the API for it, unfortunately. Uh, so I keep using this natural language parser that it has to try and query for this data in other ways. Figure, well, if there's uh, 500 hits per set SVC host, I'll just grab the specific process ID that I'm looking for and pull the data that way. Well, I try that and it comes back and says, oh, endpoint's offline or no sensors match your query, which is a little ambiguous. Like, uh, does that mean I'm not writing my query correctly? Uh, it, I think, means the endpoint's offline. So I try again, undaunted, uh, a couple of different searches, just because, you know, it's somebody's laptop, maybe. Uh, they close a laptop, they walk to a meeting, uh, and now it's back online, they're in the meeting, they've opened the thing back up. So I do a search here for, you know, show me file data for system management automation, ni.dll, that's the DLL that we saw was imported into SVC host. And in this case, the machine's online, I have results I can go view, go view the investigation, no hits. Well, the platform just told me this DLL was loaded by some process. I know it's on disk on at least this workstation. Yeah, why is it telling me there are no hits? So undaunted, I go back to my PID search, because I know the machine's online, do a search for the process ID, uh, limit it to the uh, scope for the date and time of, of, that I'm interested in. And I know some of this is probably a little difficult to read in the back, but this is the screen that you get back in the web UI for this particular platform. Uh, so it's got a timestamp up here in the upper left that I've redacted. Note it says PMUTC, which, a uh, quick side gripe about that in a second. Uh, but it's telling me SVC host, this thing's running a system, it's got the command line arguments, and those are the command line arguments I told you to note a minute ago. And then it tells me you know, the process terminated, this thing ran for a few seconds. It doesn't give me any other, there's no other data here. Like, what did this do with the file system? What DLLs did it load? Did it make any network connections? I have nothing to go on here. It's probably in the API uh, if I could query it that way and I get out lots of juicy information. In fact, I know that's the case. Uh, but just trying to use this as a sort of novice user without going into the API, not a whole lot of useful data here. So a quick side gripe about this uh, AM, PM, UTC business. And this it just seems like I'm complaining about nothing, and it's, it's a trivial complaint. I'll, I'll give it, I'll give you that. Uh, but if you know anything about UTC, UTC is 24 hour time. 24 hour time doesn't have the concept of AM, PM. Why am I complaining about this? Well, when you're doing security incident response work, it's a mental sprint, and you're trying to run as fast as you can. If you have to convert timestamps from one system that's doing 24 hour time in UTC to this bizarre form of UTC that requires AM and PM, you're just wasting cycles. So quick side right there. Uh, but this screen, as I said, it provides little to no new useful information. Nothing about network connections, nothing about file system interaction, nothing about registry changes. So there's really not a whole lot to go on here. 
As I kept scrolling through the results though, the very next process after this SPC host process exited is a PowerShell process. Remember the search was by PID. So this is the same process ID as the SPC host process that exited. So we've got process ID reuse here. So note the, the MD5 hash and the domain that it's running under. This is different than SPC host uh, and what it was running under. So yeah, take note of the MD5 hash there. And then this is the process termination screen. So this PowerShell process ran for a few seconds and exited. <laughs> and the process termination screen that the platform is giving me, uh, this is the MD5 hash for SPC host. This is SVC hosts command line arguments for the previous process. So it seems like the platform is confused because the PI, because the PID got reused within two seconds of the SVC host process exiting. So these are the kinds of things your analysts are contending with uh, when you're trying to do security answer response. It's not making the job any easier. Uh, another platform here, this is the last one we'll look at, and I'm calling this, you know, there's, there's plenty of data uh, and just not enough information. So that we're going to go back to the, the thing we started with. Uh, we've got Windows Explorer, a GUI application, parenting a, a console host application that's normally parented by PowerShell or Command Shell exclusively. And normally, I mean, you'll never see this thing have child processes. I don't think I've ever seen it legitimately. Uh, but in this case, it's spinning up a Command Shell. So we want to dive into this and figure out you know, what's going on here. And so we, dump, we jump into the EDR platform. It gives us a nice tree view of what's uh, happening here. There's my command line at the top of the screen, Windows uh, con host, no command line arguments, which is highly unusual for con host. The platform helpfully tells me it's signed. Uh, it also gives me some information about the number of mod loads, child processes, and cross-process events. That's kind of down here in the, the bottom left corner, and apologies if it's a little difficult to read. Uh, it says there are 33 module loads for this con host process, two child processes, and one cross proc. It doesn't give me any indication of, of what's normal here, which is uh, something I wish it would do. So I don't know if 33 mod loads is a lot, or 33 mod loads is too few, or if any of those mod loads are unusual. Uh, it doesn't tell me whether or not Conos normally has child process or cross processes events. This is all kind of left up to the analyst to figure out. And so as the analyst, we can dive into this information further. We can go look at all of the loaded modules. All the loaded modules here show that they're signed. I mean, this is not all 33 of them, uh, but this is all the ones that would fit on a screen. So they're all signed, so everything's good. Nothing to worry about, possibly. Uh, what about low bin attacks? So we already talked about, you know, SPC host importing the PowerShell DLL. That could be evidence of a low bin attack. Uh, so, you know, we just don't know. There's just not enough data here. What about stolen code signing certificates? So that's happened a few times where companies have been careless with code signing certificates or they've gotten hacked by three-letter government agencies and had their code signing certificates stolen uh, so that we could sign malware with it. So, you know, uh, as an analyst, you might be tempted to say, well, everything's signed, so we're golden. And uh, fortunately, we've got Padme is there saying, you, know, you double check the certificate revocation list and look for low bends, right? And uh, you've got to go pretty far down the rabbit hole on this kind of investigation if you want to be thorough. But remember, we're under time pressure. This is a mental sprint. Uh, so as analysts, you don't have time to go down every single rabbit hole here, uh, unfortunately, because time is of the essence. So how could you do this in a timely manner? Well, one way would be to get base rates. You know, this, this platform, and there are, there are platforms that do a form of this. They'll give you base rate information. They'll tell you, uh, this executable is very common in this environment, or it's uncommon in this environment. And even in this platform, there are queries you can run, and you can say, well, how often is this executable seen, or how many machines is it on? They'll give you that kind of information. But they don't give it to you at this level. Uh, to say, you know, it's highly unusual to see this given DLL loaded in this process. Uh, it would be nice if they would do that. They have the data. I think they could do it. Uh, for now, uh, they don't. So let's just make an uncomfortable assumption here, say everything in this list is fine, and we'll move along. Let's go look at uh, child process and cross-process events uh, for this con-host process. So there are three 
child host cross process events, uh, two child proc events, and one cross process event uh, for this or for this con host process. So 14 milliseconds after con host started, command shell starts. There are no arguments to command shell. What does that tell you? If there are no command line arguments to command shell, does that tell you anything? Someone's running interactively. It's an interactive shell, exactly. Uh, I have I have prizes up here for people that are participating. So um, if you're interested, come up and see me after, and I'll give you one of those. Yeah. So if you see command shell run, and there are no command line arguments. Odds are it's an interactive shell. Same for PowerShell. So 14 milliseconds after conho starts, command shell starts. It terminates after three seconds. It has no command line arguments, as we mentioned. It has no child processes. It has no file or registry rights, no network connections. It has one cross process to the client server runtime subsystem, uh, which if you know what that is, makes sense. Uh, the client server runtime subsystem is basically like a separation of concerns. You've got a command shell that might want to be able to reach out to low-level Windows APIs, and all of that is done through this intermediary of the CSRSS process. So you're typically going to see this particular cross-process event. But it tells you in the EDR platform that this handle was opened from command shell into CSRSS with change access rights. I'm like, well, what do change access rights mean exactly? If you dig down a little further uh, in the platform, they don't make it immediately obvious, but they'll tell you the specific API calls that were done here. So process virtual memory operation and process virtual memory write. You go consult the Windows documentation, figure out what those APIs can do, dig deeper in the platform, and the EDR platform is gonna say, these access rights allow this process to change the behavior of the target process. All right, well, we should probably go look at that. Uh, this thing could be doing anything. So we jump over and we look at CSRSS, and this is what it looks like in the tree view. Uh, not a whole lot going on in the screen here. There are no child process events for CSRSS. It has 33 registry modifications. I looked at all of them. None of them were interesting. None of them relate to persistence mechanisms. It's not reading any weird data out of the registry. It has 20 mod load events. They're all signed, so we're good, right? Uh, two cross-process events, one from our command shell and one from its parent process, which hopefully is unknown. But there's really nothing, if you look at this from the 10,000 foot view, it's not interacting with the file system, it's not you know, reading or writing weird data, it has no network connections, there's nothing obviously malicious here. So we're gonna move along. Let's go back and look at this other cross-process event. So 17 milliseconds after that con host started, there's a cross-process event from uh, con host into SVC host. Again, change access rights, same API calls, and this could uh, alter the behavior of SVC host, so we better go look at SVC host. So we jump over to SVC host in this particular platform. Again, no child processes, 478 cross-proc events. Is that a lot for SVC host? I don't know. Uh, is it too few? I have no idea. It has 21 mod loads. They're all signed, so we're good. Uh, one reg modification, no network connections. So we want to figure out what's going on with all the cross-processes events. On this thing. So we can load up the cross-proc events. It looks very similar to that DLL screen. I've found our con host process. How unusual is it for con host to have a cross proc into SVC host? Well, it's, this is a, a multi-page web UI, so you get pages and pages worth of data, and you can page through them as you go. This is two of seven on this page, and it's one out of 35 overall for this SVC host process, so it seems fairly common. It's like 7.5% of that uh, 478 cross process events are from con host processes. I mean, is that, is that bad, good? It's relatively uncommon, but there's enough of it that as an analyst, I'm not sure it's something I need to worry about. A uh, bit of trivia here, and this is where you're getting plenty of data and not enough information. Uh, there's Conho's parent process, that explorer process. The only reason I know that is because off to the side of the screen, there's a bunch of timestamps here that have been redacted, and I've verified that that explorer process started at the same time as uh, 
the one that we were looking at earlier. Uh, interestingly, right above this Conhos process, there's a smart screen process. Who knows what smart screen is? UAC? UAC? Uh, it's in the ballpark. I mean, that's a good guess, but no. Yeah. Yeah, so the answer there was, uh, and I think you're pretty close. Uh, basically, when a user does something that could be potentially dangerous, according to Microsoft, uh, if you visit a, a web page that has a questionable reputation, uh, if you download any active content, VBScript, PowerShell, batch file, those kinds of things, uh, and you're about to run something on your machine, Microsoft puts up this handy pop-up and says, hey, you're about to do something dangerous. That pop-up is smart screen. So this is the, really the first thing I've seen as an analyst looking through this that's giving me pause and going, okay, maybe something's fishy on this box. And if anybody else you know, sees anything here, by all means, uh, let me know. I, I can't claim to be the expert. Uh, but smart screen gives me a little pause here, and the fact that it happened right before this Conhos process that we're seeing weird behavior from, it's really the first, uh, well, it's not the first, it's kind of the next link in the chain here that gives me some indication that we could be up to something no good. Uh, so we've already, already kind of covered this. Uh, is smart screen commonly opening handles in SVC host? Out of the 478 cross-process events, this is the only smart screen process opening a handle into SVC host. So I'm gonna say it's uncommon. Uh, what is it? We've already answered that. Um, interestingly though, I mean, I've looked at investigations before where I've seen smart screen and that's always a clue. Oh, like go check the file system and go check the network connections from this machine. A few, you know, right before the smart screen process started, there's probably gonna be something there that's interesting. And in this case, there were no file mods and no network connections in the few seconds prior to that smart screen process running. So something is definitely weird on this machine, but I don't know that it's malicious. Uh, we've also got in this particular timeline, their CTF mod. And again, you know, same questions. Is it common for CTF mod to have a handle into SVC host? The tool isn't really giving me any indication, except that I can see on the screen uh, with the benefit of the timestamps that are redacted, about every five seconds, CTFmon is opening a handle to this SVC host process. So what is, uh, what is CTFmon? CTFmon is the Microsoft process that controls alternative user input. So if you bring up the on-screen keyboard, uh, and, and weirdly, uh, it also has something to do with the office language bar. So the fact that I've got CTFmon, it has some interaction with Microsoft Office, and then I've got smart screen running, you can kind of jump to some conclusions here as an analyst uh, with a little bit of knowledge, and maybe not enough knowledge. There's also where fault. Who knows what where fault is? Yeah? It's the Windows error reporting. It's the Windows error reporting service, and this runs anytime something crashes in Windows, where fault's gonna run, uh, and it collects data and will happily send it off to the Microsoft mothership if you have it configured to do that in your environment, and I think it's something you have to turn off, uh, so it comes that way out of the box. Is it common? Well, just like CTFmon, it's about every five seconds opening a handle into SVC host on this machine. Something's weird on this machine. Uh, we've already covered what it is, and then there's also run DLL32 in the timeline here, and we know from previous things that we've looked at, run DLL32 can be used for all kinds of interesting things, like a memory dump of LSAS. Well, we could go down the rabbit hole here and go look at every one of these 478 cross-process events and we'd be here all day. And, and we need to get detections out to people so that they can react to them and, and go and actually do something about it if something bad is happening. So again, as an analyst, I might spend a few minutes looking at all this stuff, but then I have to go back and look at this sort of 10,000 foot view and say, what is SBC host doing? There are no child processes. There are a bunch of cross-process events. There's 21 mod loads. There's one registry modification, no network connections, and no file mods. It's not obviously malicious, but smart screen. 
And this leaves the analyst in this state of uncertainty. Uh, whoever made this meme is a genius. Uh, you get the stormtrooper sitting in the hotel room at night wondering, were those the droids we were looking for? So that's enough uh, about the EDR platforms, and I don't, I'm not trying to pick on any EDR platform. They have made life as a security incident responder so much easier than it used to be. Uh, they're not perfect, you know, they all have warts and they all have beauty marks, uh, but have, having been in the security incident response space now for like 15 years, I wouldn't want to be doing investigations without these tools. They're super useful, but they're not perfect yet, just like the rest of us. So that's enough of the tour. Uh, you know, stop the ride here. I want to get off. Are you being primed? Probably. So we've looked at examples, right? So the examples, just to recap real quick, uh, you can miss the forest for the trees. You've got so much data and so little information as we've just seen. These tools, for the most part, they don't give us the base rates. They don't tell me, yeah, this thing always loads 33 DLLs. It's always these same 33 DLLs. I want that information as an analyst. Uh, they're prone to false positives. They're prone to false negatives. They're UTC time wasters. Uh, they get confused when process ID reuse happens, which on busy servers happens all the time. Uh, so they're not without their problems and their, and their shortcomings. But again, I love the world with EDR platforms better than the world without them. So enough of kind of the problem space. Let's talk about the trouble with maps. And you're like, maps? What does that have to do with anything? Uh, well, maps are hard. Uh, as you can see here, you know, the experts at CNN misplacing Hong Kong into South America. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, like, in my mind, EDR platforms are maps. So if you think about uh, maps, this guy, Alfred Kaczynski, is the, the father of general semantics, which is way beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, but he recognized that you know, humans perceive the world a certain way, and our, perce our perception is basically a map, and, and we're pretty bad at perception. You know, there are lots of animals and, and bugs that can see things that we can't see, and my dog can, well, my dog's deaf now, uh, but for a while she could hear things at different frequencies that I couldn't hear, and her nose is a thousand times stronger than mine, so um, he's, Kajipsi's definitely right that, you know, we don't perceive the world uh, as it really is, and he basically had this quote where he said, you know, the map is not the territory. And it's kind of a duh uh, type of quote. But he went on to enumerate all the problems with maps. Maps can be incorrect, uh, as we may have seen. Uh, did con host really spawn command shell? Uh, did the SPC host really load system management automation? And maps are lossy. They have to be. They can't tell us everything. So when I was goading you all earlier, prodding you and saying, what additional information do you want? Uh, as an investigator, we want the territory. Like, I want a memory dump, I want full packet capture, I want all the logs, I want all of the data from this environment. If I could rewind the environment to a specific time and play it forward and backward, that would be amazing. Uh, we want the territory, and, and instead we get maps, right? We get uh, a lot less information than what's really out there. Like, all those cross-process events, you can change, you know, these could change the behavior of the target process. They don't actually tell us what behavior changed, if any. Uh, so they're lossy. They're not giving us all the information. And they also require interpretation. So if you looked at a map before, there's almost always a legend down in the corner of the map. The legend is a map of the map. Uh, so maps need maps, need maps, need maps. And these are all things that uh, Alfred Kaczynski enumerated about problems with maps. So enough about the trouble with maps. Let's talk about systems of cognition. Uh, so this book changed my life, and I've got five copies of it up here for people that are interested, uh, including the person in the back who answered a question earlier. Uh, this is probably the most highlighted book I've ever read, and I've read it twice now in the last couple of years. It's just full of all kinds of great information. Daniel Kahneman, if you don't know, he was a Nobel Prize winning economist and like, kind of crossed over between uh, economics and psychology. Uh, it's a really fascinating book. And he says, uh, people when engaged in a mental sprint become effectively blind. And if doing security incident response work is not a mental sprint, uh, then I don't really know what is. So as an example of uh, just kind of setting the stage for Daniel Kahneman, 
Real quick, I'm just going to go through these slides, and you just shout out your first reaction. You know, what is this person feeling? I don't think he knows. Yeah. Looks scared. Uh, Angry. Angry. I heard over here. Confusion. Confusion. Frustration. Frustration. She's like pleading her case, you know, kind of thing. Anger. 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 Shock. Shock. Surprise. So two people here, guy, on, guy in the white shirt. He's frustrated. She's trying to keep her cool. And one of these people is not a person, so. Grumpy. Uh, he, he appears to be laughing, and the other person looks to be grumpy. And I think we'd all agree that this person is really surprised to be meeting Swift on security. <laughs> Huh. What's White's next best move? Nobody? <laughs> so, what you just experienced is what Danny Kahneman referred to as two systems of thinking. So, there's system one, according to Kahneman, and system two, uh, and this is not a Kahneman original idea, but he's done more to sort of proselytize the idea than anyone else. So, system one, 95% of our decisions that we make on a daily basis are system one, uh, system one is automatic, it's effortless, it's emotional, it's intuitive, it's how you're able to dodge things when somebody throw things, throws something at you. System two is expensive, uh, both in terms of the, the calories it takes to use system two, and from a risk perspective. Imagine, you know, over uh, millennia, being on the, the uh, savanna in Africa, uh, our predecessors you know, thousands of years ago, having to concentrate on some hard problem and completely missing the fact that there's a herd of lions approaching through the grass because they're too busy concentrating on you know, how much rice they should be exchanging or whatever the, the problem might be. Uh, so an example of a system two problem, you know, 347 times 67.4, most of us are gonna have to pull out paper or really concentrate on that. Chess puzzles, if you're not a great chess player, our system two, Optimistically, uh, down here in the bottom left, system one, sort of the implications of this, I love this, system two tasks can become system one with enough training and practice. So like this uh, chess puzzle, if you showed this to a grandmaster, it'd give you the answer really quickly because they recognize the pattern. Uh, so that's one thing that is really encouraging we should take away from this. We can all get better and, and we can convert system two tasks into system one tasks. Uh, other implications, system two, generally because it's lazy, it accepts whatever system one says. And this leads to all kinds of interesting biases, uh, which Kahneman goes into a great deal of. Uh, system one is what tracks familiarity with a concept or with a topic. Uh, and this is where you know familiarity, like if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. This is where this kind of thing comes from because system two says, oh yeah, system one knows all about this. It must be true. Uh, so we can kind of combine these ideas about maps and the problems with maps and system one and system two, at least I, this is kind of where my head is at in terms of detection space and how we can make improvements uh, and kind of tie this all back into how uh, we improve what we do. Uh, some other implications of Danny Kahneman, he had this idea about activated ideas, uh, which is, you know, the, you remember the classic Donald Rumsfeld, you know, there are known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns. The concept of unknown unknowns, like if you, you have no concept that a, uh, an attacker can inject into Explorer and make Explorer spawn conhost and inject into conhost and make conhost spawn command shell, if you don't even know that that's possible, you're gonna immediately assume that your platform is wrong. There's a gap in your knowledge there. You don't have this activated idea of what's actually possible. Uh, so that's the activated ideas concept. Base rates uh, and regression to mean, this kind of tie together, and we've already talked about those a little bit. Uh, we'll show some examples of how we can take all these sort of ideas and, and use them to improve uh, what we have to do as detection engineers. So what do we do with this knowledge? How do we make recognizing that this is good or bad as easy as recognizing that this kid is terrified or that this person is angry? Well, here are some things that, this isn't unique to Red Canary, there are other places that are doing things like this, and you might be doing things like this in your own organization uh, with detections that you're providing to other teams. 
You can do simple things like color code uh, things to indicate severity. So we do this today. If you get a, an alert from us and it's got a gray banner on it, it's probably not that critical. You've probably got some adware running that you may not want running in your environment. But on the list of the thousand problems you need to address, that one's probably pretty low. Uh, so color coding is one thing you can do. This goes back to the Explorer spawning con host uh, and con host spawning command shell. There's a lot of gaps of information there. If you don't know that the Windows console host always has command line arguments and never has child processes, that's an activated idea that you're missing, right? All you see is all there is. You see this list on the screen, and you're like, I don't know what this means. Uh, so this is an area where, as SOC analysts, we can fill in those gaps, and we can give more context, and we can let people know, hey, con host never runs without command line arguments, and it never has child processes, so the fact that you're seeing this is weird, uh, and we can explain why things matter. So run DLL, doing the, the LSAS dump, and for those of you that are paying attention, the reason that command failed earlier is because the word full was missing from the end of the command line, so that full makes a difference. Uh, we can give people context and say, you know, what's going on here? Uh, as somebody that's not familiar with this data, it might be a little difficult. So fill in the gaps and, and get rid of those uh, or get rid of that what you see is all there is by uh, supplying additional information. And here we can tell you, you know, the results of the action. So there's a file that was written uh, to disk called lsas.dump. And we can also tell you when something didn't happen. So you've got a case where uh, an office document was downloaded to a machine that we know is malicious. It was opened on that endpoint, but we never see the VB script run. So that's something else you can provide. You don't just have to leave the analysts out there in the wind trying to figure out, did LSAS really get dumped? Did it get copied off to a network drive or a USB stick? Has it been deleted? Do I need to go pull a full disk image so I can find out you know, what it was there and, and what credentials were in it? Uh, we, we can give you additional context, and these are all things that we should be doing as detection engineers. This is something I would love to see in the platform uh, that we looked at earlier. See, so these are module loads. Show me that it's highly uncommon for this given DLL to be loaded by this process. That's not something uh, the platforms do today, and I wish that they would. Uh, here's an example of a screen that a Red Canary engineer sees when we're looking at a process event. So we've got several thousand detection analytics, we call them. They're basically you know, signatures for bad behavior. You can think of them that way. We get customers' security telemetry. Uh, goes into a big pipeline. We run several thousand detection analytics against them. If they trigger against those detection analytics, in this case, there's 11 of them listed on the screen here. An analyst on our team, the ones that aren't handled by automation, uh, an analyst is going to get it. If you get something like this as an analyst, you've got 11 different detections that triggered on a single process, odds are pretty good something bad has happened. Uh, we rate our detection analytics, so we track them over time. We know how often they convert to real detections. Uh, a score of 15 is a perfect score. Every time this thing has fired, it's been something bad happening. Uh, so as an analyst, I can look at this and go, well, my goodness, there's 11 detection analytics that fired on this one process, and most of them have pretty high scores. Uh, and that just reframes how you're thinking about the investigation. You go from thinking, well, this could be a false positive to, you know, you know this is uh, definitely something bad happened, uh, and you'll just kind of analyze it differently. So uh, I think we're just barely scratching the surface on things that we can do to make this job easier for people. So quickly, let's just uh, recap. And if anybody has ideas on other things that can be done, I would love to hear them. Um, so I've argued that EDR platforms are maps, right? And defenders, we want the territory. We want all the data we can get. Instead, we get maps, and maps are lossy, which leads to this problem of what you see is all there is. Maps can be incorrect. They require interpretation. You've got to have experts who understand them. System 1 and System 2, uh, remember that System 1 is automatic. It jumps to conclusions. It doesn't even know it's jumping to conclusions. It doesn't know how big those jumps are. System 2 is going to believe whatever System 1 says. Uh, and this makes it really difficult to overcome biases because we don't even recognize that we have them. Um, we also have this issue of what we see is all there is, and when you're dealing with lossy maps, that's problematic. On the optimistic side, keep in mind that your System 2 tasks with experience and repeated exposure can become System 1 tasks. If you've ever learned to drive a stick shift, 
You've converted a system two task into a system one task, you probably don't even think about it. Uh, we need to minimize how much we rely on system two, and this is really my focus area and, and something I'm trying to tackle. Uh, and simple ways we can do this, you know, we can color code, we can annotate, we can measure our detection analytics and show those scores to the analysts. Uh, you can convert system two tasks to system one task by studying and practicing. So those are things you should be doing. Understand base rates and regression to the mean and actually show people that data, you know, whether or not it's common for a given DLL to be loaded by a process or not. And again, uh, I think we're just scratching the surface. If anybody has other ideas, you want to raise them during the q and I'd love to hear it. Uh, and with that, I will open it up to Q&A. Slides are available, scan the QR code, or if you don't trust QR codes, uh, there's a nasty URL here that you can punch in. So, uh, any questions? Yeah? What was the right move? What was that? What was the next move for white? I don't know. Huh. What was the next move for white? You, you know the answer. Uh, move the knight into position to where you have to fork on both rows. Well, that's not what the chess puzzle website says, but... <laughs> it's probably a good move. I'm not a chess expert. Anybody else? Yeah? So I really appreciate your color code concept, but I'm currently dealing with like, um, not specifically an ADR tool, but like a step back of how do you convince people to even use the tool in the first place? Yeah, how do you convince people to use the tool in the first place? Change um, is scary, and I don't want to change how I do my normal day-to-day -day job, and it's another thing. So. Yep. Yeah, I, you know, that's probably a whole other talk, topic. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you from my own experience that you know I have exposure to a lot of EDR platforms. Uh, there's a few more that I have slides for. They're in the deck, uh, but didn't have time to get into. Um, I wouldn't want to do this job without those platforms, even as bad as some of them are. But they don't. They don't recognize that they need that, though. Yeah. Yeah. People. If people don't even recognize that they need it, then uh, yeah, uh, it's a hard problem. Yeah. So. So your presentation appeared to focus on EDR, which, correct me if I'm wrong, is a lot about the host visibility. Yep. What are your thoughts on visibility at the perimeter and the network uh, that needs to kind of follow some of the directions that you're suggesting? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, where I work currently, uh, we're largely focused on EDR, although we're looking at branching out into cover, covering things beyond the, the endpoint. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a valid question about uh, network level visibility and all that stuff. And I've, I've worked in a shop for years where we had network visibility and we ran a bunch of snort sensors back in the day. Uh, and all that stuff is invaluable. Um, but usually it all comes, I mean, there are probably exceptions to this. Uh, but usually when the bad guys want to go steal secrets, they go to the endpoint eventually. Uh, I mean, there's stuff you can, you can scrape off the wire, but... Uh, I think in terms of priority, I would prioritize endpoint first and network second, but that's that's just me. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer there. Yeah. Did you have a question? Good. So you. What back there? Okay, I got something to say. Can I borrow the mic? Thanks, you bitchy. Uh, you had asked um, from a user interface perspective, like what would make that particular product easier. Um, it seemed like there was a lot of bouncing around between data points. Like, okay, I found this thing, but then I have to go search like three levels deeper to go find the next clue. Um, I would suggest maybe a tree view where we can just have it expand. That's yeah. Just, I think that. Yeah. There's uh, I think there's some billion dollar ideas and uh, for people that are good with web UI and uh, adding nice features that would make all that easier. So, yeah. And again, uh, for anybody that's interested, uh, just on a whim, I bought five copies of this Daniel Kahneman book. Uh, I owe one to a gentleman back here. If anybody wants one, don't make me take them home. Uh, I don't want to obligate you to read something. You know, it's a big time commitment, but uh, this is probably the most impactful book I've read in the last 10 years. Uh, highly recommend it if you want a copy Come up and, and see me, and uh, happy to give you one. 
Take them up on that. Round of applause, everyone. Come on.